So before we start today's episode, just remember that although I am a attorney, I am not your attorney and I am not offering you legal advice in today's episode. This episode and all of my episodes are informational and educational only. It is not a substitute for seeking out your own advice from your own lawyer. And please keep in mind that I can't offer you legal advice. I don't ever offer any legal services, but I think I offer some pretty good information. One more thing before we get started. Also remember that I am based in the United States, so that's what I'll focus on today. With that, let's actually get into it. Hey there, and welcome to a brand new episode of On Your Terms. I'm your host, Sam Vander Whelan. I'm an attorney turned entrepreneur who helps online coaches and creatives legally protect and grow their online businesses using my DIY legal templates. I also just so happen to be in the process of writing my own book. I am at the beginning stages. I am working on my book proposal, and I haven't shared this too much yet, but I, I'm so excited to be working on it. It's been quite the adventure. And I've always wanted to write a book, but I held back because I had all kinds of ideas about what I needed to have in place first before I was ever able to write a book. Not to mention all the like mindset issues and imposter syndrome and all the things that came up thinking like, who am I to tell my story? Will anyone care? People have told this story before. It's not interesting. What if no one buys it? You know, all of the things. If if you've thought it, I've probably thought it too. So you're definitely not alone. But I kind of had this like wild series of events earlier this year. I'm not I'm not like super woo, but I'm open to woo things. And I actually scheduled a chart reading um, with a astrological therapist, actually, believe it or not, in New York City. And she actually brought up the fact that I was meant to share my story in the form of a book and that it was also meant to be published. It wasn't something that was meant to be like written in a journal and locked up for only me to see. And I thought that was so interesting because I hadn't said anything about it. And that has always been a hope and a dream of mine. I actually explored the idea years ago, but the person that I spoke to at the time shut it down pretty quickly because I had like 800 Instagram followers at the time. And she said, forget it, you know, which by the way, you'll hear about in this, in this episode about whether or not that's actually correct advice. But I buried the idea at that time. And so I hadn't brought it up to this, you know, uh, to this person in my chart reading, but she also said that not only would I write a book and would it be published, but that I would fall into this process through an organic connection, that it wouldn't be something I'd have to like fight for really hard or something like this. And so I thought that was so interesting. And what do you know, a few days later, I was talking with a friend named Jen Rakopi, and we were talking about her book that she just came out with. And I said, you know, I really want to write a book. Do you have any recommendation on like where to start? And she said, yes, I'll tell you where to start. You need to start by talking with Rochelle Fredson. I was like, who is Rochelle? And Jen connected me with Rochelle and bada bing, bada boom. Rochelle is now my book consultant, my book coach, and we are working on this book proposal together. I'm I'm writing the proposal with um, Rochelle's help. And it has just been an amazing process. But I really wanted to bring you this episode with Rochelle today because I wanted to create an episode that I wish that I could have heard before um, for the person who has always had this feeling, this intuition that they were meant to write a book, or you just have a genuine interest in writing and telling your story and expressing yourself in that way, but you also really don't know where to start. And you might have heard so many different things from like, you have to self-publish your first book, or if you self-publish, you'll never be able to get published in a traditional way again, you know, or there are all these things, um, even about your social following, like you might have heard, like you have to have a huge following, you know, in order to do this. So, I wanted to bring you the real deal from a trusted, trusted expert and resource, which Rochelle most certainly is. So in this episode, Rochelle and I talk a lot about um, the confusion around writing a book, some of the myths. um, We demystify a lot of the things that people think about what you need to do to write a book and all of that. We talk about Rochelle's experience um, and how all the different pieces of her career led to her having the book consulting business that she has today. I really love that as an example of seeing how your prior experiences play into what you do now and how like nothing is a wasted experience because I believe in that so strongly. Um, And she tells us what a book coach is and what they really do for you, like the different types of book coaches um, that you can reach out to and who needs one. We also break down the three different types of book publishing. So from self-publishing to the hybrid model to traditional publishing, which I know 
I knew nothing about. And Rochelle was so helpful. And she really breaks it down for you so beautifully in this episode. She also, I think the gold is in the middle of this episode where she gives us three things that people should do now if you know that you someday want to write a book or if you're just starting out and you want to write a book. She tells you the three things exactly what you should do. She talks to you about some of the biggest changes and shifts in the book industry, whether you really need a big following, everything in between. I just thought this was such a great episode. Um, it was actually my first guest episode that I've ever recorded. Um, and I was so excited that it was with Rochelle because she's just lovely. And I know that you're going to love her too. So with that, let's get into this interview with my friend, my book coach and consultant, Rochelle Fredson, all about um, how to publish uh, a book, how to start writing your first book. And if you like this episode, I would love for you to screenshot and share it by tagging me at Sam Vanderwillen and Rochelle at Rochelle Fredson on Instagram. Send me a DM, send Rochelle a DM. Let us know what you thought about this episode and make sure if you're not already follow and subscribe to On Your Terms so that you get a notice for every new episode. And if you listen on Apple Podcasts, it would mean the world to me if you rated and reviewed the podcast as well. With that, let's learn how to write your own book. So I am so excited to be doing my first guest podcast interview today on On Your Terms. And it's with my friend and my own book coach, Rochelle Fredson. I am so excited that Rochelle's here. So for her formal fancy introduction, Rochelle is a book publishing coach and consultant helping aspiring authors with book concept development, book proposals, platform growth, and book launches. She's also the host of her own podcast called Bound and Determined. And at the end, we'll share more about where you can connect and listen. Welcome, Rochelle. I'm so excited to be here and I'm honored that I'm your first guest on this podcast. Yeah, I'm so excited too. Well, it works out for me because I'm so used to talking to you anyway. So <laughs> it's not true. like it's not like that awkward for me. Not yet, but you know, maybe later. Very easy. Uh, yeah, exactly. So I am so excited that you're here because I wanted to bring you on today for two reasons. One, I am only taking a very select handful of guests whom I love, and you're one of them. Um, so it's not going to be a regular thing. And I want to talk with people who do things on their terms, who help other people do things on their terms. You're definitely a person that came to mind when I thought about that. But also because in my own community, I know that there are so many people who want to write a book. And I think that there's a lot of confusion around it. I know I had my own confusion around it that you helped me break down but there's also a lot of like, there's only one way to write a book or there's a right way to write a book. And you have a lot of people on social media being like, the only way to write a book will ever be self-publishing or the only good way to write a book is to do traditional publishing. And it feels really overwhelming. And I also talk a lot about on your terms, I talk about not focusing so much on social following and like getting hung up in, in like vanity metrics. And I think you're really helpful and you were helpful to me in understanding that writing a book is not only for quote those people or like people yeah. with a big following. So I'm really excited to get into like the real deal of book writing with you today. I'm excited. I love demystifying publishing because I think you're right. There's, there's so much information out there and everyone is pushing their own agenda. Mm. And I have very little agenda besides just letting people know what their options are because I think people get very attached to one style of publishing or they think there's only one route, but there are more options available now than ever before. Like if you want to write a book, you can write a book. Yeah. I'm excited too for you to break down what all those different types are because I remember that was the thing you kind of blew my mind with because I had only been exposed to people who had very specific types of businesses and they were like book coaches who help people to self-publish, you know? And I, to me personally, there's nothing wrong with that option, obviously. But for me, as, as Rochelle knows, that was just not the way I wanted to go. And so, but it was helpful even to understand why and what the pros and cons are, like there are cons too. But I think before we get into all that, it would be so helpful for people to know what you were doing before you started your own book coaching business. Yeah. So I started my career in PR, media work at a, actually a, an agency in Southern California. And I was doing products like WD-40 and McDonald's and the Sony Vio laptop launch and all of these very big things with very big, juicy budgets and just tons of money to spend a lot of fun to do. But what happened was I looked around and went, oh my gosh, the people that are sitting in these jobs 
they're not me. Like this isn't actually how I want to live my life. There was a, a lot of pressure, super high pressure. There wasn't a lot of movement and growth. And I just said, this is not for, it's for many people. This is not for me. And I sort of accidentally fell into to book publishing, which makes my parents laugh to this day because I was the kid that never finished a book in school. Just forget it. I wanted the Cliff Notes version of everything. Um, I don't even know if Cliff Notes is a thing anymore. I Did know, I just probably, age it's myself? It's probably all online now. I yeah. don't know. <laughs> it's all online. <laughs> yeah, you don't sure. have to go buy the little yellow just book. Google it. Yeah, I think you Google <laughs> exactly. it now. <laughs> so essentially, I, I started my career in publishing about 18 years ago. And I, again, started on the PR side. It was my comfort zone. I thought, you know, I know how to write a pitch. I know how to get people on TV shows. Like, let's stay in my comfort zone in this new industry. Mm-hmm. Um, and then over the years grew through much bigger PR campaigns for books. Um, I had lunch with Oprah in her house. I would have died, uh, <laughs> just for the record. <laughs> delicious, delicious gazpacho. Wait, was salad. this in her Santa Barbara home? The yeah. one that I want to live next to. One it's day. beautiful. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. Imagine. Yeah, yeah. So I, you know, was booking clients on Super Soul Sunday and and her old studio show in Chicago and Doctor Oz and all the the big things, and it was so fun. Until it wasn't, right? It's it's a really, again, high pressure job trying to please a lot of people. It's hard because authors really are writing about so many things that are really important to them and really um, intimate and vulnerable. And so when you aren't able to always match the industry excitement with their excitement, you know, it's it's tricky. But it was really rewarding for a long time. And my role sort of segued from PR into digital marketing launches at the time that publishing sort of said, okay, social media is this thing now, right? Email lists are a thing now. How do we meet those standards? And so a lot of the PR roles started to transition into digital marketing roles. Like how can we reach the most people through these somewhat organic channels that authors have created. So I spent uh, a long time doing big digital marketing launches for New York Times bestselling authors and first-time authors. So really learning how to communicate that goal differently to two different types of people uh, at different parts of their journey. And then ultimately began working in acquisitions in tandem with that role. And that was really cool because now I got to meet with agents and authors and read many, many book proposals and help decide what we would buy and publish. So I got to use all my former hats from PR and media to digital marketing and social media and all of that to determine what would be the most marketable buy for the publisher. So that's what makes my job now so incredibly fun because I get to use all of that former experience to help craft things from the ground up. Yeah, I can see that firsthand, obviously, as a client of just, and I love too that how much your background plays into what you do now, because as you have taught me so much about that nowadays, writing your own book, wanting to go the traditional publishing route, it's not this like fairy tale story that I think we all, people like myself, dreamed of that, like, you know, my book would just like show up in Barnes and Noble and everyone would be celebrating it. And so there's a lot of legwork on our own end for marketing the book. And so I can just see how much that would help with what you do and how much like realistic uh, advice you bring to the table. Thank you. I mean, and you really, what everyone should want is a book that sells for a long time. And I think sometimes when we get caught up in publishing a book, it's how do I make this a bestseller right away? How do I you know, sell thousands of copies in my first week? And that's a sort of short-sighted way to look at the publishing process. I mean, a book is this concrete thing, right? We're holding it in our hands. It's not easy to reproduce. You know, you're printing thousands and thousands of copies. And of course, there's eBooks and audiobooks, which take a lot of production. So the goal is always like, how can I create a book that's going to sell well long-term and sell consistently? So part of that is that marketing lens of how do we get that flash and how do we create something that's sustainable? What do you think distinguishes a book that that would sell for a long time? What, what What like ingredients does a book like that need? Yeah. I mean, usually tackling the things that are plaguing everybody all the Mm. time. Right. The me too factor <laughs> yeah. of like people just being like, oh, me too. Or you're like, yeah. you're in my mind, you're in my head. I think, I, I don't know if you find it like if it's helpful, but when, you know, people on your email list or whatever, right back and we'll say like, it's like you're in my head. It's always those topics I tried to think about. Like, obviously, that's what's connecting with people. 
Yeah. And it's a lot of the emotional components. So when I think about sort of flash books that will sell quickly, but for a short amount of time, they're things like fad diets or, you know, the next great um, cookbook genre or something like instant pot things like that they have like a great kick at the beginning and then they're going to slow down naturally when the next great thing happens. But when we talk about human emotion and the human experience, that is forever. So, and it's, it's proven to me all the time when I just show up more vulnerably on my social media too. Last night, I did a post about feeling really conflicted as someone who runs a business and and is a mom. And my son is sick and I felt guilty for having to move things around my schedule. And my final line was, we have to remember we're more than the work that we do. And the comments were blowing up with people going, this was me today. I needed to hear this. And that's those are the tidbits that create a good book. Like, How can you get people jumping in and going, this is me. I needed this. This sounds exactly like me. I see myself in your book, in your story. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking when you said that. It's like in every good copywriting course class, whatever that you take, it's like, everything, I always think of anything that I write as a mirror for other people or a mirror, as my dad would say, but a mirror for other people <laughs> that, you know, that they're, they're seeing themselves in it. You know, what? It, at the end of the day, let's just be real. When people read stuff, they're thinking like the what's in it for me factor. And so completely. Yeah. So I think we all get like real excited about telling our stories in a book, like, oh, I've had this story of me my whole life. But it's like, yeah, but the point is it has to be helpful to other people and it has to like reflect back to to them, but yeah, hundred that's like a reflex for me now when I'm talking people through their book process. It's like, this is so good. I love this story about your life. And how do we show up in the teacher seat? How do we now turn the camera and bring the reader into the fold and help them have that reflection or look at that experience? But you're right. When people read story, their you know anecdotal story or personal story they're often substituting in their own experience into that so when people ask me how much do i need to share in my book like how vulnerable do i need to be how open do i need to be only as much as you're comfortable with and only as much as they need to get the point and see themselves in that story so right. You're right. We're all just thinking about ourselves. It is true. I mean, it's just the way human, <laughs> the human psyche works. But I mean, the people who were reading your post last night were probably like, oh, thank God I'm not alone. Like, I'm not the only person who feels this conflict and this guilt and this pull to want to be both a business owner and an entrepreneur and a great mom. And then feeling like you're not doing either that great sometimes because you're being pulled, you know, so people can, people can really relate to that. And they, people don't want to feel alone, period, end of story. Like that's just like, <laughs> yeah. That's the whole point of creating a yeah. great book, right? Like, yeah. like, let's just know that we're all in this together. Yeah. It's like a hug. I mean, that's, I, I was an avid reader as a kid and I loved, like, I felt like the characters in books were like my friends. <laughs> so that sounds really sad when you say it out loud, but the, <laughs> it's not sad. My husband you know says I mean. that too. Like he has <laughs> yeah. a few books. He's like, I'm definitely the Holden Coffee. Like she's like, <laughs> definitely has references. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that for sure. So tell me a little bit about how you though went from all of these having lunch with Oprah, um, which I'm now super jealous about, and to to actually starting your own business and your coaching. And what is that what brought you to New York, by the way? So the publishing house brought me to New York. And part of that move was that uh, it was a Southern California based publisher, Hay House. And the company grew large enough to really be competitive with some of these major publishers. We needed a New York presence. So they sent me out here with one other person to start the New York office and really start meeting with agents and talent in person. And so that was very exciting for me, right? I I was the first one in my family to move away. They're all still back in California. You know, I sold my car. It was like a whole different lifestyle moving to the big city. And I loved it so much. But the really the tipping point for starting my business, and this is like the ultimate on your terms moment, <laughs> yeah. is I had my son, right? So I, I gave birth to Cooper. I it was before that, just working a lot of hours and managing a lot of campaigns. It was a lot and I loved it and it filled me up, but I was thriving on sort of that chaos a little bit, the go, go, go hustle. And then I had Cooper. And while I was on maternity leave, I was like, if I could curate a business or a role or a position that only tapped into the things I really love about the work that I do, 
what would it look like? And about two months into maternity leave, my brain started firing on all cylinders, just ready to be back to doing something. I mean, God bless motherhood, but um, I was ready to start thinking about something else. And uh, of course, still sleep deprived and not making a lot of sense. But I would just walk to the local coffee shop in Brooklyn, where I was at the time, and just listen to podcasts and take notes and think about, could I really create something for myself that feels like it would fill me up and be an actual lucrative business and allow me to not miss the moments of my Mm -hmm. life that I don't want to miss? And I went back to work and again, I, I loved everyone I worked with. It was a great, you know, it was a great job to have. And I realized very quickly the shoe didn't fit anymore. I had this sort of wake up call to what I wanted my life to look like every day as a, as a mom and, and someone who built a career. And so the someday when plan became the now plan. And I just leapt into the great unknown. I had very little plan in place before I was like, this is what I'm doing, guys. I'm going all in. I want to help the people that don't have the roadmap to getting published. Like I've worked with some of the biggest names in the nonfiction industry and they're wonderful. They also have huge teams of support. How do I help the people that don't know who to look to? And that's really when Purposeful Platforms was born. That's amazing. Yeah. People who still have incredible stories, but don't have the same resources, obviously. And so, yeah, yeah, that's really cool. So, and had you heard of book coaches before you kind of created this business? No. And I have to tell you, I had a real identity crisis with calling myself a coach just because especially being in the industry that I'm in, people are very quick to use that label. Yeah. And so for a long time, I was, I was just kind of framing it as a consultant, a publishing consultant. And when I first started the business, I was really focused on helping people understand the benefit of a platform because I'd spent so long having to turn down really great books because the platform wasn't there because that's where the traditional publishing model was. Right. And they still are. They're very focused on the platform, but there were so many great teachers and great writers that weren't getting the attention they needed because they they didn't know how to to teach online or how to show up online in a way that was effective. So I started really heavily on the platform side and then was like, you know, I have all of this amazing PR and marketing experience. I know what makes a good book proposal because I was the person on the other side of the table for a long time. How do I take all of that knowledge and build these develop the idea for these great books? And so I just started doing it because I was also really confident in what mm-hmm. I knew. And so that's one thing that I've never really been hung up on is like, I know that I have what it takes. It's just about doing it in a way that doesn't burn me out. Yeah. And so I had to build a formula that did that. Yeah. But I love how you went into it ahead of time, knowing that you wanted to do things on your terms. I mean, a lot of people say they want to start a business because they want like freedom and flexibility, but it's kind of a loftier thing. But it sounds to me like you went in, I think also when people come from a corporate world and transition into being their own boss, you have a better idea sometimes of like exactly what that looks like. Cause you, you've done the other way. Like you've given up all the small moments in your life and you've sacrificed probably your health and your well being yeah. <laughs> and your sleep and a whole bunch of other stuff at the time. But I was I feel sick like, yeah. so much when I was, when Same. I had a, a more corporate position, I was sick all the time and I didn't recognize that it was connected to the way that I was treating myself because I was so focused on the next great thing and climbing the ladder and, and just giving so much of myself. And what's interesting is that transition into the new business, like there was a period of time where things felt very quiet because I was used to such a juggle and I had to get comfortable in the moments that were more quiet and not make abrupt decisions, right? Not take on a client because I felt like I needed the money. And I, of course, everyone at the beginning of their business does that stuff because you're like, oh my God, I need to pay the bills. So I'm going to take on a client. I learned pretty quickly about six months in that if I took a client based on money, it often didn't turn out well. So I had to get really clear on who the right person was for me. And that was just trial and error at the beginning. Yeah, for sure. And by the way, if anybody wants to learn more about this topic, I just did an episode um, a few episodes ago about uh, warning signs, like client warning signs and bad clients and like who to take on and who not. But I also talk about like how sometimes it's good to make some of those mistakes in the beginning because you'll you'll stumble through. So I'll, I'll link to that in the bottom. But I was hoping to, Rochelle, you would tell people like 
what is a book coach? Like if they've never heard or a book consultant, like what, what exactly does a book consultant do for people and who would need one? Yeah, there's all different kinds. So there's certainly people that coach you through the proposal process and help you write the book and things like that. They're more of editors, I would say, more than book coaches. And then, like you said, there are some people who coach you because they have their own publishing model within their business. And often that's for self-publishing. Well, it's only for self-publishing that I've seen. There may be other kinds out there. But the way that I work is essentially you come to me when you have an idea for a book or you have a business and you know that that book is going to be a part of your business and part of your offerings. And you're you're like, okay, I have this coaching practice or I have this legal business or I have all these things that I do for entrepreneurs. How do I take what I know and create a tool that brings in business that fills my coaching programs, right? That becomes this entry point for people to discover what I do. So people come to me at like the bud of an idea and Usually my consults start with people saying, I'm not a writer, but I want to write a book. And I tell them that everybody says that. Mm -hmm. And I help them essentially develop the idea, you know, and I I it's the marriage of of what I know and what they know. And together that makes a really marketable idea. So, you know, we work through the proposal process and oftentimes I'll do agent introductions and help them through the process. And a lot of it is just being that person they can turn to when number one, they hit those moments of uncertainty. And there's a lot of like, sort of, I'm not a substitute for therapy, but there is a lot of sort of therapy conversation happening in the work that we do because it's vulnerable, but helping them navigate all the questions that come up, like, you know, what type of agent do I need? Do I want to go, you know, self hybrid or traditional and just figuring out a route that's right for them. And so there's no template to what I do. It's just, it's connecting to another human and guiding them from what I know in the industry. Yeah. Yeah. And just to let everyone know, I hired Michelle in that way to came to her with, I don't think I said I wasn't a writer. Not that I think I am a writer, but I like to write. <laughs> so I don't, I don't think I said it, but, but I, I came to Michelle saying like, I have a lot of ideas. I just don't know what direction to go in. And so you were really helpful in not only like nailing down that idea, but I think what's been so great about our work together so far, and we're, we're working on the book proposal now is that you've helped me so far to craft something that balances this like storytelling, like the stories that I did want to get out and that do emotionally connect with other people to like, here are tips about how to grow your business because I didn't want a like, I don't know, Gary V style <laughs> book or something. Like I didn't want this like bro marketing or this like straight up strategic, like I wanted the hybrid. And so, um, but I, I obviously first and foremost wanted to be helpful to other people. So like, I guess I wouldn't just say to anyone who maybe has an idea, but is struggling to figure out how that's a marketable idea. That's, that's can be really helpful to work with someone like Michelle. Thank you. Yeah. And more often than not, people come to the table and they have 10 ideas that they're trying to fit into one book, right? I'm like, this is actually, this is a whole series of books, but how do we not overwhelm the reader? And the beautiful thing about integrating story is some people will learn from the tactical tidbits that you give them. And some people will learn because they see themselves in your story. So having all of that makes a really complete beautiful book. I love the sort of straddling line of prescriptive memoir, the you know, storytelling and help. Yeah, it is fun. And for some, if anybody does something like what I do in the sense that it's like very technical and can be like dry and boring, I've found that storytelling has broken me out of this cycle of like, I used to feel like frozen about what to write about. Cause I'm like, Oh, can I really write another post called like what three website policies you need on your website? Like I need to, I need to tell, you know, I, I, that's how I write. And so I connect even all of my emails to my list about these podcast episodes is all a story that then links to this episode. And so I just find that like it can unlock lock some for some of us who feel like we have to express ourselves in that way. And so I found the book writing or book proposal writing process really like freeing in that, in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I think it would be helpful for you to explain to people how, what the difference is, well, what the publishing options are, and then like what the differences are between options like self-publishing, traditional publishing, hybrid, all that. Yeah. Yeah. So the three options are what you just said, self-publishing, hybrid, and traditional. (laughs) (laughs) Such a good student. Uh, Let's start from from sort of the, the biggest down. So traditional publishing is what people mostly know about book publishing, right? It's Simon & Schuster, it's Random House, it's the agent process. So 
you would need to create a book proposal and you would need to have a, a pretty you know, thriving platform, you know, so your social media is kicked off, you know, you've started building a community and I don't like to assign a number to that because I have seen books with, you know, 5,000 followers get a six figure deal. And I've seen people with 200,000 followers get a more modest deal. So I don't like to give a number. It's really about, are you showing up and talking about what you want to write this book about, right? Are you present? Are you showing up publicly? to teach or to create conversation and community. So you need the proposal, you need that platform to be you know, thriving, and then you would need an agent. So the first sort of hurdle is getting an agent to represent you because they're the ones that are going to go and knock on the doors of all the publishers and say, I have something really great that you should pay attention to. Your agent is like your best friend in this process. It's why I work so closely with agents because to me, it's an energetic decision um, in addition to sort of a tactical decision, right? You want to work with an agent that's going to champion you. And so it has to be the right fit. Um, So once you've secured your agent, they will look at your proposal and make any tweaks that they feel it needs. And then you're sort of off to the races. You um, will start getting some interest from publishers. Your agent sends out your proposal. And um, you have publisher meetings and now they're on Zoom, but you essentially talk to their editorial team. Sometimes they're marketing and salespeople and they will make a decision on if it's something they'd like to publish and then they offer you uh, an amount of money and that's called an advance. So you get paid an advance to write the book. For first time authors, that could be, you know, it could be $10,000 to $250,000 up to $500,000. I've seen it in every range possible. But typically, first-time author advances are a little bit more modest um, unless you have a a sizable platform. So that's the traditional publishing process. You obviously have internal teams. So you have a marketing team, you have a sales team, you have your on-staff editors, um, you have distribution. So it's being put in Barnes & Noble and trying to be sold to Target and Costco and all the big box stores. So it's sort of um, this all-encompassing way to publish. The challenge in today's market is that it does skew platform heavy. So to break through the noise, you either need a really strong proposal that builds the case, or you need a really strong platform, preferably both. But hybrid publishing, which is the middle ground, so the middle ground between self publishing and traditional publishing is a more recent model that's emerged over about five, six years, credibly speaking, uh, over the last five, six years, and has basically been formed of people that left traditional publishing because they felt it wasn't an author-centric model. So they wanted to leave the, the sort of stricter business side of publishing and create a model that put more of the power back in the author's hands. It doesn't require you to sign over your creative rights to your material. You don't need an agent. You need a proposal, but the whole point being that they acquire more based on content, less about platform, whereas in traditional publishing, the platform is more of a a contender for getting a deal. So hybrid publishing, you do not get paid in advance. You pay for the services that you use within the publisher. So if you want to use their editorial services, there's a price for that. If you want to have them design your cover, if you want them to sell your book and distribute it, there's a price point for all of that. Kind of all in, you could expect about 15000 for that. You're also paying for the cost to print the books, which is in there. But the highlight being you earn more of a royalty on each book sold. So you can earn anywhere from 30 to 85% on every book you sell, as opposed to traditional publishing, you get on average 10%. So there's opportunity to make a little bit more money faster, though you're not getting paid in advance. But you get to be in creative control, which for a lot of my clients, they really want. And you're faster to market. So traditional publishing, right? There's not a lot of wiggle room on the timeline. You can expect 18 to 24 months from the moment that you sell the book, the moment you sell the book to the publisher, not counting proposal and all that other stuff. In hybrid publishing, you could expect nine months to a year. So you can really, if you're someone who's like, I need a book in my business stat, that can be really helpful to look at the hybrid publishing model. Um, And I have a couple of clients that just really love having that, more of that creative control. And then- Beyond hybrid publishing, there's self-publishing, and that is the you, you, and you model. (laughs) So 
essentially it's all, it's on, all, you. It's yeah. all on you. <laughs> and what I would suggest to anyone, and I have clients that and friends that have self-published and love it and wouldn't do it any other way. But what they learned from book one to book two and book three is that they needed to hire support. So to make a really professional product, you will need to hire an editor and a designer and all of those things because you want it to look substantial and be competitive in the market. So there's, of course, you're making 100% of the money, which is awesome. You just need to know that you're going to invest in some support from editorial and design to make sure you get it out there. That is so helpful. I didn't even know before working with you, I didn't even know that the hybrid model existed. And I think it's really helpful for people to understand that there are different options. What would you tell someone though, who has this idea wants to start a book is at the beginning of the process, you know, really doesn't know where to go about which one of these little branches to choose, like who, which one is right for the right person. Yeah, that's a really great question. I think at the beginning, you don't need to decide. I think the beginning is what is this book going to be and what is the impact that I want to make? Um, which is why even my friends who have self-published will tell you the value of doing a book proposal, even if you do, if you want to self-publish. Because the discovery, as you're experiencing now, the discovery that comes from creating a book proposal and you know the, the clarity... And defining the mission and all of that is really invaluable. So you want to go through that process and then go, okay, how long do I want to wait to have the book out? You know, Do I want to take the time to build a more substantial platform? Is my business ready to launch this book? There's a lot of personal considerations, but at the beginning, it's like, let's just figure out what the book is and feel confident in that so that I can feel empowered to make the right decision on how I want to publish. Yeah. Really give yourself options. And it sounds like one of the most important things to think about ahead of time would be how does this fit into my business? Considering everyone who listens to this podcast is an entrepreneur. So if you're writing this book as a personal project versus like, is this going to be an entry point to a funnel? Is this part of your marketing? And even you know, as you're describing all the different options, I'm thinking how long term this is. Like how much this is in the long game, right? So for somebody like me now who's been in business for like five years, like I was, I was like, okay, it doesn't matter to me. It takes a couple of years. Like I can see my business now. Long term, we're planning for things that are that are that long term, you know. So I could see an argument for maybe going more of the hybrid or self-publishing route if you're closer to the beginning of your business need to get your feet under you and start that marketing funnel as opposed to this being like something that you have like an audience to sell to already. Yeah. I mean, the truth is like your business or your platform are your only customers at the beginning, which is part of why traditional publishing puts so much emphasis on the platform because they're like, this lessens our risk. Right. If we know that we can marry our contacts with their contacts, we have a better chance of success. And obviously, in traditional, you uh, you get you know a certain number of weeks of PR and marketing support, which is awesome. Hybrid is now matching that too with some of their services. If you self publish, those are additional investments you're going to make for yourself. So, look for the average business owner or entrepreneur. The number one question you should be asking yourself is how is this a tool to grow my business? Because you can integrate so much of yourself and your personal experience into this, but the book should be rooted in what your core expertise is. And that's something that we've talked about in our work together. It's like, especially traditional publishers, they want to know that your first book out of the gate is grounded in what you do. So you have a better chance if you have an, a, a business of your own um, or you're you know, starting a nonprofit or any of those things that you want to make sure that the book is an offshoot of what that core expertise is. Yeah. And I know that so many people think that writing a book in and of itself and then like selling that book is what makes you rich, but it's, I mean, not only through our own work (laughs) together. Yeah. I wish you guys could see Rochelle laughing, but the, but not only through our own work together, but even just in our conversation, like it's sounding to me, like what people should be focusing on instead is how the book will actually be part of the marketing funnel that could make you rich because it leads to the service, the program, the product, whatever that you sell. But the book itself does not make you rich. I feel like you should have this on like a big sign somewhere. I do. Every time I speak in public, I go, do not write a book to make money. Like launch a course, launch a mastermind, a group program and a membership, anything 
the, a book is so wonderful for so many reasons. I mean, again, like bringing in clients, growing your business, uh, legacy, all of those beautiful things, but it's not a fast money maker. There's this beautiful like permanence to it, which we talked about earlier, but it really, really is the long game, but it's an incredible tool for opening more doors of opportunity. Yeah. I always think about like Phoebe Lapine who wrote the wellness project. And so like she wrote the wellness project, which chronicled 12 months of her life that where she focused on a different wellness aspect each month. And so it's, it's kind of broken up like the happiness project. And then she started a group program called the wellness project. So every time people were reading the book, they were then like going to her website, opting into her email list. Then she was emailing out however many times a year to say, Hey, this group program is opening. And then people were enrolling in this group program. And I was like, Oh, that's how a book fits into this marketing funnel. It's so good. And I use my client, Chrissy King, as yeah. an example all the time, right? Chrissy. And she, yeah. she's so great. And so she wrote an article for Shape that was around body liberation and her experience in the fitness industry. And she got contacted by a publisher that was like, Would you write a book? And, you know, it was it was a great offer. She had no clue. And she would tell the story the same herself, but she had no clue like how to make this decision. Was this the right decision? And so she reached out to friends who put her in touch with a literary agent who then sent her to me because we know the power of a great book proposal. And so that book proposal was a significant difference in publisher interest and offers for her. And that's the truth. It's, um, and she's not the only example I have like that. It's It's like if you're out there in the world doing great work and you know making waves in your industry, there's probably people already watching you. I have a number of clients who say, oh my gosh, like Tarcher or Hachette, they're following me or the, an editor reached out to me. And what I always tell them is like, great, now write the book proposal, right? Yeah. Because it's it, like you, it's, it's hard to hit pause for a minute because you want to take that great, that opportunity. But doing a great book proposal puts the power back in your hands so you can negotiate for the best deal possible. I had a client who had an offer on the table, a great offer. She called me and said, write the proposal, write the proposal. She's like, are you kidding me? Like they sent me the contract and she got three times the offer. She knew she wanted to be with that publisher, but she's like, it gave you negotiating power. And I'm all about like giving authors like the power to make those decisions for themselves. Yeah. Cause when you have clarity, you can speak so much more confidently about what like you're actually bringing to the table. But when it's like a lofty idea, it'd be really hard. But I feel like if you walk in there with a book proposal, you can actually say to them, like, this is exactly what I'm going to talk about. This is how it's going to connect. This is what I'm going to teach people. This is what's unique about it. This is like what people are already asking for, you know? I feel like that would be so helpful. And social media has just opened up opportunity to like in that example of, of Chrissy sharing the article for Shape. And I have a client who is a sex therapist and she has ed- editors from publishers following her. And, you know, it's just, it's cool. And you don't know who's lurking, like not in a creepy way, but in, like in general, by the way, <laughs> in general, just, <laughs> beyond, beyond editors, just, <laughs> <laughs> just there are a lot of lots of weird creepers. people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but in, in, in the best sense, yeah. Uh, professionals who can help you get your book done. But I think it's, uh, it's, a great sort of reminder to be conscious in the way that we're teaching and sharing and being consistent about it because you just never know where the opportunities are going to come from. Yeah. And you actually were so helpful in teaching this golden nugget. I want to pass on to other people in, you know, once I had my head around what's the book going to be about, what's the, what's the general premise. Then you started telling me like, make sure that you're actually teaching about those topics, right? So that if someone goes and looks at it, like a 30,000 foot view of your business, do they see like some blog posts about this? If you have a podcast, a YouTube video, whatever, but like making sure that you're actually touching on those things and that they really are my like core, you know, teaching areas, I guess. Yeah. It's interesting because I think a few years ago, publishers weren't looking so specifically at people's businesses and now they are. So I have a client who went through my book proposal program and he's got this really killer book idea and we built out the proposal. It's so, so good. And he sent it to a few agents that were all like, I'm obsessed with you. I love this. I can see the need for this. But there's no place in your business where you can use this as a tool, right? There was a that that's what I mean about that disconnect between the the what you want to write about and your core expertise. And while it was his core expertise, there was no offering in his business to sell it long term. So he actually hit pause and said, I'm gonna go build an arm of my business that supports this. And I have no doubt that once that's up and running. Publishers will come, you know, 
knocking down the door because it's so good, but publishers want to know that you have a way to sell it for the long haul. Yeah. And that's probably, you know, what has attracted people to their community and like why they want to be. I mean, the legal thing that I always compare this to is like, don't sell people health coaching and then talk about vacuums. That's what I always say, like from a legal (laughs) perspective, that's not okay. Right. Because of like a whole can spam act thing. But also I think from a marketing perspective, like it wouldn't make any sense if I came out now with like a self-help book or something, but it's also like the end of the road. And I think going back to what we were talking about before is like, for example, if I sold a self-help book, that would be the end of the revenue road for me, like just buying the book. And we've now just talked about the fact that books don't make you money. So then what the heck is the point? Like the book should be the entry point to the larger thing in your business, at least from my perspective. Yeah, 100%. By the way, your (laughs) podcast has got me thinking about um, the way I respond to people in my DMs, right? Like, because I get people who are like, what agent would you recommend? And like, what do you think about this book idea? And it's like, I can't, like number one, I can't make any of those decisions without being so immersed in what you do and who you are. But like, it's it's interesting because I could see now how any type of response in those situations could be problematic. Yeah, it can be. It can. We just have no idea what the like the person on the other end of this question and like. Yeah, there's just, there's so many. I always, you know, that I'm obsessed with cooking. Rochelle loves cooking too. But there, I always think about this, like when chefs will talk about this, how like on, on social media, they'll get asked like a like question about something about the recipe or changing the recipe. And they're like, I need to know like what altitude you're cooking at and what kind of oven you have and whether your oven's even to temperature. And like, are you cooking on gas? Are you cooking on electric? What are the tools you're using? Are you using cast iron? Like there are so many elements. And whenever they talk about that, I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what it's like for us. When you get a DM from somebody, whether they're asking about a book or their health or fitness or their money or their career, it's like, there are like 9 million questions that have to be <laughs> answered, <laughs> let, alone, let alone all like the legal problems that come up from all of that. So. Yes, exactly. very much. Yes. One of the biggest things that I wanted to ask you, because this is something I really wish I would have heard someone answer back in the day, is what are three things that someone should do right now if they know that they want to write a book, but they've not taken any steps to do so yet? Yeah. Read books. <laughs> it's the <laughs> first one. <laughs> it's, it's very like figure out. It, it, it's such a hilariously basic uh, answer, but it's true. I think the more that we read and the more that we consume in our genre, we start to see what we like and what we don't like about certain books. And it, and it helps get the wheels turning about what we want to create. So that's sort of entry level you know, answer. The second is throwback to the platform, right? Is it's like mm-hmm. start experimenting, start dabbling with talking and teaching and doing videos and Instagram lives or all the things you want to do around that topic, because there's often a gap between what we want to write and what people actually want from us. And the more that we can experiment and gather that feedback and use it to create our book ideas, the more power we have to create something our community wants. So there's that, okay, if this is what I want to write, if I want to write about meditation or yoga or uh, you know how to run a YouTube business, I want to see you out there having some of those conversations and experimenting a little bit. And then three would be, well, this is a tough one because there's I, there's a few in my mind, but I would say this is something I give my group students as a task before we begin. But go on Amazon and not in a snarky way, but start looking at some of the books in your genre. Like if you know you want to write a prescriptive memoir, you might look at, oh gosh, I don't know, like uh, probably 90% of the books on your shelf would fall into that category. But if you know you want to write about childhood trauma or loneliness or uh, entrepreneurship, search that category and look at some of the leaders in that space. And then go beyond that and click on the one and two star reviews. And this is what I mean about this is not snarky. This is Intel, right? (laughs) This is just how we strategize. Rule out the reviews that are like, this was terrible, or there was a page missing or any of those things that are just like, that doesn't tell me anything. But there are often reviews that say, this was really great and motivational, but I didn't know what to do once I was inspired. Mm -hmm. Or I felt like the tone was a little bit this or that. There's this intel that we can get. And what happens more often than not, especially um, for my clients, is it energizes them because they go, oh my gosh, Like I see where I fit in the market now. 
I see where I can, my voice and my story and my formula or protocol or whatever I do, my framework, I see how it fits in the market now. And so it, it's both research and it helps energize you to get really clear on where you want to go. Yeah, that's super, super helpful. I can see too how it makes you... I always think of like an ice sculpture that starts out as like a a rectangle, you know, and you're kind of like taking the chainsaw and making the little carvings. And so I actually, the book that Rochelle has, one of the books Rochelle has behind her is um, Maybe You Should Talk to Someone by Lori Gottlieb. And I remember when I read that and then I I really liked the book a lot. And then I remember I read the reviews and there were so many reviews being like, I found her tone condescending or I found that she was too self-involved. And I was like, wow, that wasn't my takeaway at all. And so it was interesting for me to say like, well, that was the kind of book that I was attracted to, like that speaks to me. And so it just kind of helps me to find my voice, I guess, as a a writer. Exactly right. And I should preface all of that by saying, your book is not going to please everyone. Yeah. Like or nothing any, you do, you do ever. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so like when it's like tonal comments or like, you know, this vibe or whatever it is, um, if that's not a match, it's not going to be a match for everybody. But what it can make you conscious of is how do I want to integrate stories beyond my own? Do I have anecdotal stories, client stories, you know, success stories? How do I want to move beyond myself to create more of a balance in the tone? So yeah, there's a lot to be discovered. And I don't expect when people go through that exercise that they're going to know how to make sense of everything that they discover, but that's where someone like me or a coach will come help you dissect it and go, okay, this is what's really valid about what we found here. And these are the things that are just like, someone was having a bad day. <laughs> yeah. and, you know, we can't, we can't judge that. Triggering. Yeah. Triggering yeah. them for some reason. Yeah. We call them Lynn at Sam Van Wielen and then <laughs> LLC. Uh, those are Lynn's. Um, Lynn's making yeah. it in the book too. Yeah. Lynn is making it into the book. She's really made a quite of the impact. Um, <laughs> what would you say? I mean, because you have been doing this now for so long, what would you say are some of the biggest changes or shifts that you're feeling, you're experiencing right now in the industry and what you foresee a little foreshadowing of what you see coming in the book publishing industry. Yeah. I mean, I, I think more than anything, more choice for authors, right? More routes of publishing. I think for so long it was traditional or self-published and, and there were huge gaps in that. A lot of the books that were being self-published weren't, people weren't getting support or didn't know how they were going to sell it. I didn't have a promotional or marketing plan ready to go. There wasn't the prep work. Now I think there's more options for self-publishing. And now we're seeing hybrid publishing, obviously, take a real hold in the market. I will say that there are hybrid publishers that do this very well. And then there are some, just like any industry, that can feel a little off. So, you know, you're going to want to do your research. And I'm always happy to give a few recommendations of who I've worked with previously and my clients have. Um, Page two is great if you are writing, um, especially for women entrepreneurs or writing a personal story primarily for women. They're great health books for any of the listeners that are writing very strong business books or a sort of uh, social justice and things like that. There's a great publisher named Amplify. Most people have heard of She Writes, which is great. You just want to do your due diligence and make sure that if your antenna goes up about anything that you consult a professional to make sure that you're making a great decision. But just more options in general. And I think in the traditional publishing space, it's that arm of the business, right? So you know, the last few years, it's no surprise to anyone that, that a platform has been um, an, a key part of the process. But now it's like, I've seen people get deals where they have a strong business and maybe they just haven't been showing up on social media. I mean, look at a lot of the therapists and doctors and physicians and things that are getting great publishing deals and great books that have just been in practice, right, for 30 years. Like they're smart, credentialed, well-known people that are just like, I'm not going to be on Instagram a lot. And that's okay. So it's like building that credibility in the marketplace will continue to be important, whether it's through social media or or within your business. So just getting that honed in. And I think, you know, I, I... I think we're starting to see more diversity in That's publishing. That's what I was going which, to ask you. Oh yeah, gosh, what about representation? So, yeah, yeah, makes me so happy that that publishers are really um, have opened their eyes to the fact that we need to learn from diverse voices and amplify diverse voices. So that's really a huge shift. Thank God. My friend Bex Baruki started her own publishing company. So we might see more of that. That's awesome. Uh, Row House Publishers, where she publishes diverse voices and experiences. And um, as a result of just uh, of not feeling that that existed in traditional publishing. So now um, there's definitely more awareness, which is great. What else? 
I don't know. You know, the second we get off this interview, I'm going to think of one more thing, but those are the primary <laughs> those are all things pretty good of. things. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Those are all pretty good. I was going to ask you about representation, BIPOC voices. I definitely feel like I see that on the fiction side. I read a lot of fiction, so I feel like I've gotten more diverse stories. I mean, these stories have always existed. I think the fact that we just don't get to see them very often and they are probably not being given the same opportunities and platforms and exposure. So I hope that that is getting better. I also hope that the, you know, equity and in, in payouts and things like that is, is getting yeah. better. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I actually, that makes me think of one more thing, two more things, actually. One is that I think we'll start to see more creative contracts in traditional publishing, whereas um, traditionally it's like a, a the biggest chunk is the advance and then everything breaks down after that. I think now we might start to see if it's a more modest advance sales bonuses um, and some of those things being more prominent. They're happening already, but it's not as prominent or, you know, sort of rev share models, things like that. So I think people will start getting more creative with contracts. And yeah, I think more, more equitable contracts as well. Yeah, I hope so too. Maybe that'll have to be a <laughs> template in my future. Um, <laughs> but I hope so too. I'll make equitable uh, publishing contract templates. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I would just love for you to speak quickly about uh, a little bit about like those to that person who feels like I can't write a book until I have a huge following. I was stuck in that mindset for a long time. And I think, you know, talking about maybe how to balance what you're what you're suggesting to people, which is like focus on that community. And I know that you're talking more about depth of community versus like metrics. But how do you do that while not staying there too long and being like, I can't publish this business or I can't book or I can't even start to work on a proposal because I'm not big enough yet? Yeah. I mean, it, it's interesting because I think they go hand in hand in a way. And again, I want to throw back to my many clients who have had smaller platforms and still gotten really great deals from major publishers. It's a factor. It's not the end all be all. So don't let it stop you from writing the book. But I think that the biggest piece of advice at the beginning of the process is to niche down. right? And I say all the time, a book that's for everybody is a book that's for nobody. And I think when people are starting out, their scope is so wide that if they just brought the walls in a little bit and got really clear on what aspect of what they do they want to write about, then it starts to energize how you show up online. And so you get to then have more confidence in teaching and being more public facing and getting really specific in what you do. I mean, look, my whole business, like book proposals, right? Do I edit full books? Nope. Right. And and people ask me that all the time. I'm like, I know my lane. And so that makes me a really strong expert voice. And so I, I own that. And so if you're if you have a very broad lens for what your business is, I would ask you to sort of start shrinking that in to a focal point that's going to help you not only create a better book idea, but help you show up on your platform in a more effective way. Mm-hmm. That's really helpful. Yeah, that's really helpful. My last question for you before we get into the what I'm labeling as fun Q and A. We'll see <laughs> what Michelle thinks later. <laughs> but stay tuned. But my last question was about whether it's possible to write a book nowadays on your terms while also still getting it published and actually putting it out into the world. Yes, a hundred percent. I mean, this is, this is what's so great about this time in publishing and all the options that we have. I mean, and, and it's not that, that choosing a route other than traditional publishing is any type of failure. It's you making a decision that fits your life and your business and the joy and the experience you want to have in the process. So it's much more empowering than it ever has been before. Yeah. Even uh, now that you're saying that, I'm thinking even the the route that you choose to publish the book is can be on your terms because that can be to your timeline, the way you want to tell the story, the way you want to control the marketing and publishing of that book. Like I was always thinking of it from a storytelling perspective and having somebody kind of like whittle down or water down your story, but that makes a lot of sense too. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that was so helpful, Rochelle. I hope so. I'm going to force you to come back one day so that we can talk about kind of like the next phase because you're also obviously a marketing PR expert. So, for people who maybe already have self published, we'll talk about marketing or we'll talk about those people who might be in the book writing phase. But with that, I want to get into our fun QA. <laughs> okay. okay I, know, I know the answer to some of these already for you, but I'm going to force you to do it anyway. Would you rather read fiction or nonfiction? Nonfiction. It's a pretty even balance. Like I'm drawn to nonfiction because a little bit of it is research and also just I I like self-improvement things. I like things to open my eyes. But if I really want to get lost in something, 
it's it might be fiction. Well, is there like a great nonfiction book you've read lately that you would recommend? Yeah. I mean, I really love Dying to Be a Good Mother. It was is nonfiction, part memoir. I really loved Untamed. Oh, yeah. Like Untamed was really good. Mm-hmm. Have you read Crying in H Mart yet? No. I can't wait to read that. After the post move, I was like, I can't wait to read Crying in H Mart. I'm really I'm excited gonna, about that. I'm going to read that. Yeah. I'm reading Casey Wilson's memoir right now, The Wreckage of My Presence. And it's oh. both hilarious and deep, which is what I, that's like, those are my qualifiers for yeah. like a great book. Like, can you make me cry and laugh and snore <laughs> same time. and sob? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a pretty good qualifier. It's All so right. Good. We'll, yeah. we'll, uh, we'll turn a link to those, um, below. Okay. Would you rather live at the beach in the mountains or at the desert? Oh, the beach. I mean, I'm a Southern California girl that, you know, up until I moved to New York and I love being near the water. In fact, my apartment in New York is on the water because it's just, you need to be I near need it. it. Yeah. I need it. Well, yeah. Come, come visit. There's a lot of water here, <laughs> but I love to vacation in the desert. That's oh. like the, it's funny. I have a friend that lives in um, like Gilbert, Scottsdale, Arizona area. And so when I'm out there and in the desert, like oh, there's something so calming, about that, just like the spaciousness and have you ever done an astrological (laughs) chart reading with Jen? Did you do one with Jen? Jen, Yeah. 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 Did she tell you you had a lot of water and fire signs? I mean, I'm like fire, fire, fire up and down, but I think the balance to that is on in the day to day, the water. Yeah. Because I needed, I needed water, but I also needed more earth like stuff. But she, she told one of my friends that being around the desert, like if she couldn't live there, then at least going there many times a year was really important to her sign. So I was wondering whether yeah, she told I you can, that. I can get yeah. very zen in the desert. Yep. Yeah. That's so interesting. <laughs> All right. Would you rather have coffee or tea? Coffee. What's your go-to coffee order? Uh, right now it's a coconut milk latte iced. Oh. Do you go somewhere near you in New York? It's funny. I get well, right when I'm walking Cooper to school. Yes, I will go to either Starbucks or there's a place called Jack's. Which oh is yeah, good. I've seen that. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, but I've been ordering a gigantic box of cold brew from La Colombe. Oh yeah, Philly. It's Philly's own La Colombe. <laughs> it's so yeah. good. It's so yeah. good. It's so, like I have like the spout coming out of the fridge, and so that's most often what I do. That's what you do, and then you put yeah. your own coconut milk in there. I do. Yeah, that sounds really good. Yeah. And always iced in the heat. And then my, my winter brew is a little bit more confusing. I do half Lavazza tart oh, roast yeah. and half Illy medium roast. I do uh, like a scoop of each. And then in the grounds in my coffee pot, I shake a little cinnamon smart, stir it into the grounds. I'm telling you, you'll never go back. So good. I know so that good. is so good. I love that too. All right. Do you, I know you love to cook too. So when you cook, do you clean up as you go or clean up at the end? This is a great question. <laughs> I dump in the sink as I go, and then my husband does the, <laughs> the a little That's bit of the a... marital agreement. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Michelle does the hybrid option of cleaning. My mom is a real cleanup as you go, like is loading the dishwasher as she cooks, and I, I have such admiration for that. I, I am not that way, but I will dump in the sink. Yeah, I had a, I have a friend who her and her husband had to like have a talk, and they decided that they had to clean up before, at least before they sat down to eat, because they found that like if they sat down to eat and then cleaned up after it was like so miserable and stressful. So they agreed. I thought that was really smart. I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Good hybrid option. Would you rather go to a fancy restaurant or hit up the best food trucks? (gasps) Oh, food trucks. Yeah. Like 99% of the time food. Gosh. There's like into the waffles. one. It's Dingle. Is it called Dingle? Waffles and Dingies or something like that. Yeah, Uh that is good. There's also a grilled cheese one. I want to say it was really Uh grilled cheese. I just, I love like a, like a hole in the wall Mexican situation too. Like really good Mexican food taco stand. Yeah. 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 That's a California girl. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) If it's my birthday, because I'm like such a Leo, like, you know this, but like, it's going to be like a fancy restaurant with like 15 people. Yeah. What's your favorite fancy restaurant you've gone to in New York? Oh gosh. I mean, I love Scarpetta. I loved the four seasons before it shifted. I haven't been back since. 
And my mother-in-law also enjoys a fancy meal. So often my meals have been <laughs> with her. So we do a lot of like the Jean George restaurants and things like that. You and I it have always to taste go. better when you're not paying for it. Yeah, know? that does taste a little sweeter. There's something, something about that. You and I definitely have to go to something. I'm dying to go to 11 Madison Park now, especially now that they're plant-based, even though they would do like a custom menu before, but I am like mostly vegetarian. So I'm, I'm, very excited about that. Yes, come and yeah. we'll go. I'm, d- I'm down. Uh, my American Express gets you a reservation. Shout out to Amex because they hook you up with the Sponsor best us. reservations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're amazing. Um, okay, last question because it's you. Is what uh, would you rather read a physical book like paperback or ebook? Physical book, 100%. You I, and I don't book. even know where my Kindle is. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't connect to the material in the same way. No, it's not the same. It's really I can't annoying. even do audiobooks, really. I really like to hold it. I get hands. super distracted. And uh, it probably doesn't help that the only audiobook I ever tried listening to was Rachel Hollis. And like 37 mm-hmm. seconds in, I was like, nope, like, I, <laughs> like you're gone. <laughs> so this is probably the hard part. Help. Like, if the voice doesn't resonate, then it's it's going to be a miss. Yeah, that's yeah. Hard. I called that one years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Not for me. Well, thank you so much, Rochelle, for doing this. This was so helpful. Will you tell everybody not only where to find you, but what you've got coming up and how they could work with you if they love you as much as I love you already? Oh, thank you. Uh, So purposefulplatforms.com is the website. Uh, You can follow me on Instagram at Rochelle Fredson. And the podcast, as you mentioned, is Bound and Determined with Rochelle Fredson, where I teach. I interview industry experts, all the things. I have a group coaching program called the Book Proposal Blueprint. And I take people through a 10-week program of creating their book proposal from the ground up and helping them navigate the agent process. And I also work with people one-on-one throughout the year. So if you're curious, just hit me up and we can talk about it. That's awesome. And it sounds like um, for anybody who was listening today and was probably really had their eyes open to a lot of things that Rochelle taught you, it sounds like the blueprint might be a good fit if like the one-to-one isn't right for you at the moment. And you t- you told me earlier that you'll be, by the time people listen to this episode, you'll be enrolling for the February cohort of that, right? Exactly right. February 8th. Mm-hmm. Cool. And the best way for them to get into that is to just reach out to you through email, social purposefulplatforms.com, click on the group coaching tab and there's a way to set up a consult. Oh, perfect. Okay. So we'll make sure we have that link for everybody and we'll give you all the links to find Rochelle and the podcast and everything in between. Thank you so much, Rochelle, for being my first podcast guest. (laughs) Thank you for having me. This was so fun. Thanks so much for listening to the On Your Terms podcast. Make sure to follow on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you like to listen to podcasts. You can also check out all of our podcast episodes, show notes, links, and more at samvanderreelen.com slash podcast. You can learn more about legally protecting your business and take my free legal workshop, Five Steps to Legally Protect and Grow Your Online Business at samvanderreelen.com. And to stay connected and follow along, follow me on Instagram at samvanderreelen and send me a DM to say hi. Hi.